a Multnomah County commissioner thinks we should have even tighter COVID restrictions. And she tweeted those thoughts from Hawaii, where she's on a two-week vacation. And the one thing soccer and air travel have in common, at least during a pandemic. And after a weekend of property destruction, Mayor Wheeler says arrests need to happen. They're vandals and they're criminals. But a viewer wants to know, will anyone actually be held accountable? Here's the story. Maybe you are a viewer who wants to know something. Let us know what you want to know and we'll let you know what we know about it. I'm Dan Haggerty. Hi, welcome to The Story. You can email us at thestory at kgw.com. You can send me a tweet using the hashtag HeyDan. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. You can write me a good old-fashioned letter. Feel free to use cursive. I can read that. I will admit, though, um, I have been screening my inbox a little bit uh, lately, looking for one name in particular that's been set to high priority. I get a little ding if it comes in. It's Tootie Smith. Tootie Smith, the future chairwoman of the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners. Tootie Smith, who said that she's going to throw a big Thanksgiving party with all her friends and family, carving the turkey and stuff. Tootie Smith, who went on Fox News and said Governor Brown's order treats us as, quote, second-rate slaves. Tootie Smith, who said twice she'd give me an interview and then did not. Now, apparently, a lot of you are keeping track of this as well. Viewer Tracy Henderson tweeted yesterday uh, during the show and said, where's Tootie? Is there an update? My hubby and I watch every night waiting for the interview that she told you she would grant. Well, Tracy, and to all my 2D watchers out there, we, we still haven't heard back from her, not yet. So I did today what I didn't really want to do, and that's to tweet her, which is, kind of, which is a public thing to do, to do, to see if she was interested. And I said, Tootie Smith, have time for a quick interview today? Question mark, and I tagged her in it. Now, Tootie is pretty active on Twitter, so I was hopeful, and I know you're wondering about her response. So, here it is. The worst part is I don't even speak cricket. But I think what they were telling me is to keep trying. So here's hoping Tootie comes around and gives us a few minutes. But look, the thing is, Tootie Smith isn't the only Oregon leader making questionable choices this pandemic holiday season. And that brings us to our big story. Now, if you missed last night's the story, that's fine. The governor refused my mandate to make all of you watch, but uh, we told you about one of Multnomah County's commissioners taking a little me time. Sharon Myron is currently on a two week vacation out of state and defending her decision to do so. But Kyla Boshi investigated a little further and found a few Oregon leaders jet setting off somewhere else while our hospitals are filling up here at home. A number of elected officials in Oregon are facing public backlash after vacationing in Hawaii and Mexico as coronavirus cases surged at home, resulting in travel warnings and COVID restrictions. We just at the beginning of day three and we're having a great time. Washington County Commissioner Dick Scouten joined a recent Zoom meeting while on vacation in Hawaii. The weather's been great. During the same November 10th commission meeting, county officials urged the public to take precautions and described a reduction in some services by appointment only. This is very important to protect public health. From a public health standpoint, do you feel like you're leading by example? Yeah, I think so, absolutely. I mean, I think if you if you have an opportunity to 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 take some dying, some, take some downtime, as long as you're following all the rules and regulations, uh, and, and and you're willing to be flexible to you know to to change uh, as 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 events change. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Since late October, Oregon has seen a surge in COVID cases. Despite dire health warnings, Washington County Commissioner Jerry Willey said he too would be traveling. As you all know, I am departing for Mexico Monday morning very, very early, so I will be out as well. Willey's vacation to Mexico appeared to be in violation of Oregon Governor Kate Brown's November 13th advisory, urging Oregonians not to travel out of state. Willey was not available for comment. As for Scouten, he started his vacation before the governor issued her advisory. I was taking a vacation and I was doing, you know, I was doing everything that uh, that the law uh, says that you can and can do. Multnomah County Commissioner Sharon Myron also drew criticism from county employees and the public after spending the past two weeks at a condo on the Big Island of Hawaii. I am working virtually and I am also um, having a 
vacation. Myron, who's an emergency physician, has called for restrictions on public gatherings and business operations to help slow the spread of the virus, but is unapologetic about her travel. Nothing that I've done actually contradicts anything I've been saying or doing. On November 13th, Myron tweeted, at this point, we need to go back to staying home. A closer look reveals that tweet was posted from Hawaii. Okay, Kyle Boshi joining us now. Kyle, I want to talk about uh, the excuses that are being made by these politicians, and they're sticking by them, too, um, and why they're not necessarily landing with people. Well, I think it looks bad. You talk to county officials and also what we're seeing on social media, it's the optics, it's the appearance here. You know, so many of us have made sacrifices, whether it's kids can't go to school, businesses are shut down, or we've canceled vacation plans of our own. And yet you have these elected officials now that are going to Hawaii or going to Mexico. The other thing that I'm seeing a lot of is concern about the mixed messaging. On one hand, you've got government officials saying stay home, restrict travel. On the other hand, you have these elected leaders that are going to Hawaii, they're going to Mexico, doing the things that a lot of us would like to do, but we're not. Got it. I think you're exactly right. Kyle. Appreciate it, man. But look, we know it's not just this handful of public officials jetting off somewhere like Hawaii or Mexico or wherever, you know, despite the fact that the CDC is practically begging people not to travel for Thanksgiving. We know that millions of people are. I mean, there was this one report I saw recently that said like three million just last weekend were traveling, which sounds like a lot to me. And who knows? How many are actually going to be flying tomorrow and the next day? And then don't forget, everybody's got to come back home. So how many people are going to be flying after the holiday? We know people are traveling. And the question then becomes, what are airlines going to be doing to minimize the risk? Kristen Severance learned it depends on the airline. You know, were you nervous about flying? Kind of tell me about it. Well, yeah, I mean, this was my first. uh, I've done not much more than go to the hardware store and grocery store since April. Yeah, I was nervous. I I had no idea how it would feel on the plane with just a seat between us. After doing his really, research and like weighing the risks, happy. Gary Cash took an Alaska Airlines flight from Portland to Puerto Vallarta last month to get away. Alaska Airlines has committed to not filling the middle row until January 6th. But it didn't take long into my flight when the gentleman next to me pulled his mask down and just left it down. Gary took pictures on the flight down to Mexico and back of a half a dozen passengers not wearing their masks. And then people sleeping with their masks down. Uh, Maybe a 10 to 12 year old young man sitting in the last row right there next to the galley. But his mask was down the all three times I walked by. Gary said he told the flight attendants, but nothing was done. He wrote a letter to the Seattle-based Alaska Airlines and said he received a canned response outlining their policy. I, I don't really know how, how to describe other than I'm still angry. Gary's complaint had us look up what action, if any, airlines take if customers don't follow the rules during COVID. According to the Alaska Airlines policy, a face mask is required for all passengers over two years old. A passenger will be told to put on their mask verbally, then handed a final warning in the form of a yellow card. Passengers who don't listen could be banned from future flights. Alaska did not tell us how many yellow cards have been handed out this year or how many passengers have been banned. There was never a yellow card handed out. When it comes to other airlines, Delta has banned 550 passengers for not wearing masks this year. United has 370 passengers on its no-fly list over mask issues. American has a banned list, but we don't know how many passengers are on it. Southwest requires a mask, but doesn't ban people who won't wear one. I really thought that they would be on top of it, all things considered. We, We are no way out of the woods yet to have not one or two, but a half dozen passengers on a plane so clearly not complying and nothing being done about it. It shouldn't have to be that way.
Okay, Dan, I can hear the story viewers right now without even checking social media. They're probably saying, but you're not supposed to be traveling right now. And they're definitely right. But remember, Gary's flight was last month. Gary told me he would fly again once the CDC says it's safe, but he will probably use another airline. Do you have a story for us? Do you have something for us to look into? Let us know. Just use the hashtag. Hey, Dan. And thanks to Kristen, by the way, Kristen did end up hearing back from Alaska Airlines and they told her that her pictures that she sent them are a quote big deal and they're going to be following up with managers about Gary's complaint and that they have banned 181 guests for not wearing masks on board this year. I still think people get very confused when we talk about the severity of this. You hear all the narratives going around, and I think uh, one of the best ways to understand this pandemic is to not incessantly read those case numbers or the deaths or the hospitalizations. While those are very important, they do kind of miss a key factor when you're just looking at numbers, and that's the human element. If you want proof, you know, right here, that this pandemic is serious, just talk to the people watching our hospitals fill up. Today, our Morgan Romero talked to an ICU nurse at OHSU just, you know, about what she's seeing day in and day out. Listen here. Um, it's distressing because we have no idea who's going to end up in these, in these um, critically ill situations. The sheer volume of cases that we're seeing is um, something that we're all getting nervous about. I'm worried about not having the resources to take care of all the all of these patients, you know, they, they are so critically ill and, uh, you know, we're taxed. We are, we're working so hard now. It's not just about people who get sick with COVID-19. It's, it's about everybody who needs care in our state and also in our region. There's this whole new layer of, um, between us and our patients, you know, we are, I've got a P100 on my face. We've got a face shield that's been cleaned off and, you know, is streaky and, you know, we're in full gear and, um, you know, trying to communicate with our patients and, um, you know, provide them the best care that we can with all, you know, they, they've only seen my eyes. It's been really challenging to f support families in that situation, too, because they can't be at the bedside. It, it feels so unnatural and it goes against every part of, you know, it just breaks my heart. And I know it's hard. We're all so tired, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, but I hope that um, they understand that these little actions and decisions and choices that they make in these coming days and weeks about whether to get the family together or whether to expand their bubble just a little bit for these celebrations that we love, you know, um, that the impact could be devastating. Um, it could be their loved one in my ICU bed. No matter what your plans are over the next couple of days for the holiday, I just hope you're keeping people like Aaron in your thoughts and the people who are in her thoughts when you hear tearing, tearing up like she did. Because our actions this holiday don't just impact us. They may impact everybody who we come around, who we encounter, including our family and our friends. And if you get sick, then the doctors and the nurses are charged with treating you. When the story continues. I was uh, staying in a hotel room, couldn't afford it anymore, and I ended up on the street. It's not much, but it's something, 40-somethings, that are better at keeping Portland's homeless population warm than tents are. And they need to be held accountable. But are they? After a weekend of destruction in Portland, we found how many people are actually facing property crime charges. A lot of people sharing what they're doing over Thanksgiving with us. Uh, there's a conversation on my Facebook page right now. If you're wondering if what you're doing is a little lame compared to years past, just 
get on there and read and realize everybody's is kind of toned down, which is good, which is what we're supposed to be doing. Welcome back to the story. I'm Dan Haggerty. I don't know what it is. The conversation using that hashtag, hey, Dan, has really been incredible over the last couple of days. Hopefully that means that a lot of you are, I don't know, staying safely inside, watching more of us. I'm <laughs> always a fan of that. I always try to read some comments at the end of the show, too, so keep them coming. Use that hashtag, hey, Dan. Email us at the story at kgw.com. In the meantime, why don't we keep this uh, train on the tracks? Now, I want to jump right back in with a multi-part question that we got from a viewer named Ann M. Emerson, who asked, Mayor Wheeler said the vandals should be arrested. I agree. So why aren't they being arrested? And if they are arrested, will they be prosecuted? Mike Schmidt, who is the DA, has stated that he will not prosecute minor offenses. I don't believe destroying property is minor. All right, and it sounds a lot like you're referencing kind of what happened over the weekend across Portland. Starting on Friday night, several different groups of people damaged businesses along Sandy and some, some buildings in downtown Portland. You can see some of the video of it here, including the county courthouse and the Mexican consulate. Then yesterday, Mayor Wheeler came out and said that he has no tolerance for any of it. These are not protesters engaged in this activity. They're not supporting some just cause. They're vandals and they're criminals. And as such, they need to be arrested and they need to be held accountable. Now, as far as to answer kind of your questions there, as far as, you know, what's going on with the arrests, we can tell you that police made none on Friday. Apparently when the people who damaged those buildings downtown uh, were met by officers, they ran and they got away. On Saturday, when all the damage happened along Sandy Boulevard, again, everybody got away by the time the police arrived. So no arrests in these particular cases. That doesn't mean there won't be any arrests. There are investigations happening right now, but no arrests yet. Now, and to the second part of your question about minor offenses, see, Multnomah County District Attorney Mike Schmidt has softened the county's stance against prosecuting protesters, but that doesn't mean no one is getting prosecuted. Dozens of cases are still being pursued by the DA. As of today, his office is pursuing 145 protest-related cases, and 53 of them are related to property crime. But keep in mind, you have to remember our report back in October, we told you that the office was also dealing with a massive backlog of nearly 6,000 open cases from just this year. So they are swamped. I hope that answers your question, Ann. If it doesn't, fire another one our way and we'll try our best to answer it for you. Hey, let's switch topics now. One of the biggest crises facing Portland, really the whole state, I think, is homelessness. It's also one of the hardest to solve. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there just seem to be a lot more and more people living on our streets right now than there ever have before. And the temperatures are also starting to drop fast. So some local leaders now are working to get some people out of tents and into something a little bit warmer. And while it's not going to help everyone living outside, it will help some of them. Catherine Cook got a look at what they're doing. You can look at someone on the street and think that they're not trying, but you don't understand that they might have just recently lost a job or recently couldn't afford their place anymore. Brian Hall's story starts in Las Vegas. He worked in a casino there, but the pandemic ended that job. So he came to Oregon for work, which didn't pan out. I was uh, staying in a hotel room, couldn't afford it anymore, and I ended up on the street. In a tent, Brian, like so many others, was cold, damp, and worried. Not just about catching COVID-19 and theft, but about how he'd get out of the cycle and back indoors. Knowing that you can sleep with peace of mind is, is I, I can't, there's no words I can't describe it. It's just you can actually sleep and then focus on your day for tomorrow and get your things done that you need to do to help you get off the street. He's hoping for all of that within these four walls. On Monday, crews began installing 40 temporary outdoor shelters in Old Town to replace tents in this outdoor community. It's one of three outdoor emergency shelters that opened last spring, run by the city and county's Joint Office of Homeless Services. Each home provides heat, electricity, a locked door, and bunk beds, and costs around $6,000. The city is footing the bill. These communities offer transitional support, meals, drinking water, and bathroom facilities. Really, this is meant to be something that anyone can get into because um, we want people to be living in a better situation than they are now. Amy King is founder and CEO of Pallet, the company that manufactures these temporary shelters. Pallet also employs people exiting the justice system, addiction, and recovering from homelessness themselves. We also utilize them to produce these units and they were the ones who helped us finalize this design from their lived experience and told us that this was what would make a difference for them in lieu of living in tents or out on the streets. By next month, King says Pallet will have deployed 1,500 beds across the country. 
But watching this pot go up is extra meaningful. I grew up here in Portland, and so I have to say when I drove into town today, I was shocked at how many people are out on the streets in tents. Um, but Seattle's the same, LA's the same. We're seeing this in cities across the country. The hope is these homes and communities will help transition residents into permanent housing. For Brian Hall, it makes him believe I'm really thankful, you know, that this is not the end of his story. Catherine Cook, KGW News. Last week on the story, we told you about this kind of unprecedented battle happening in Salem for House Speaker, the position there. It's between two Democrats, current House Speaker Tina Kotek on the right there and Representative Janelle Bynum, who is challenging her for, the num for a number of reasons, including giving people of color more power in the legislature. But now we've learned about another element in this fight that's pretty interesting. Well, Amit Week is reporting that the investigation into another lawmaker might play a part in which candidate Democrats vote for. This is State Representative Diego Hernandez. Hernandez. He represents Portland. Now, in May, he was accused by seven people of sexual harassment and creating a hostile work environment at the Capitol. He's been under investigation ever since. We don't really know a ton of the details, and there have been no findings released yet, but Hernandez has denied everything. After he was accused, Speaker Kotek immediately called for his resignation, but that apparently didn't sit right with some of the members of the legislature's Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Caucus, which both Hernandez and Bynum are a part of. Now, when Lamette Week talked to one member who isn't happy that Speaker Kotek called on Hernandez to resign before investigators released their findings. Bynum alluded to that in a statement she sent us yesterday, saying, quote, Management 101 requires that strong leaders uphold a fair and transparent process that centers the needs of victims and honors the rights of the accused. After months of work by the Oregon Law Commission, a $1.1 million settlement with hard-earned taxpayer dollars, and a lot of pain, the legislature's respectful workplace policy is still a work in progress. My colleagues and I would best be served by turning inward and asking ourselves if the current situation is the best we can do. My answer is a loud and resounding no. We shouldn't settle for a process that allows leadership to put their thumbs on the scale. Now, we're still waiting to see the results of the investigation into Diego Hernandez. Of course, we'll let you know what happens with that. But the House Speaker vote is happening in January, and we're keeping our eyes on that as well. In the meantime, if you want to hear more from Bynum about why she's challenging Kotech, we've got a full interview for you on the KGW YouTube channel right now. In the meantime, we're going to be back right after your commercial break. we got uh, some comments to read, so send them in. Use the hashtag HeyDan. Email us at thestory at KGW.com. We're going to wrap this thing up next. Another comment from my Facebook page we just put on the screen there. If you want to tell us how you're changing up things for Thanksgiving, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, I'm going to get to some comments about tonight's show. This one coming from Colin Orton. He said, hey, Dan, people are terrified about graffiti and not about the staggering amount of unacceptable police violence that has been leveled against the citizenry of Portland. Why is that? So I hear this argument a lot when we talk about property damage that we have seen downtown. And um, it can be both. I, I don't think that there's an argument that the people of the city haven't take, taken the discussion of police violence and accountability seriously. Uh, if you compare, I mean, that has been proven day in and day out. But the citizens can also be concerned about laws being broken, businesses being vandalized, especially some of these businesses that are already being hit so hard by COVID and the restrictions that are in place there. So it doesn't have to be one or another. Uh, it has to be a conversation about the best city moving forward, in my opinion. But if you don't agree, hit me back, man. We'll keep talking about it. Uh, Bob Wolf said, OK, the Multnomah County DA is backlog. However, his cases are way down. I don't know how true that is. Again, uh, I ask if there is any comparison to Multnomah County to Washington or Clackamas County's DA as far as the number of cases they've prosecuted. I'll look into that. I'm inter I'll be interested in that as well. But th that's apples and oranges type of thing. I mean, the, the population in Multnomah County alone, not ne and then you take into consideration everything we have seen with the protests night in and night out and the violence that is uh, spurred from that. So I, it's kind of difficult to compare those, if you ask me. And then uh, Fred Neal writing in and saying, me thinks it's inappropriate to sport a pocket handkerchief and not wear a tie. Fred, I 
I, I'm sorry, buddy. You are incorrect, my friend. This is the look. The tie with it, it's too matchy-matchy if you ask me, but what do I know? That's the story for tonight. I'll try to know more for tomorrow night. We'll see you then.